Hey everyone and welcome to Watch Parties here at CCC where we pursue Jesus together through Watch Parties and we're so excited and glad that you are joining us this week. No matter where you are, we're uh, glad that you are joining us. And as you know, if you've been with us since the fall, we've been having a special emphasis as growing as disciples of Jesus going through uh, the Bible Project's 99 Essential Doctrine. Uh, but before we go into what we're continuing to do uh, in this segment, I want to again highlight Rooted, uh, which is our intentional pathway towards living like Jesus and to get you serving here as a volunteer for Jesus. This is something for you and Rooted will help you learn who we are, what we believe and how to help you get more involved here. And so you can click the link in the description below or you can vi visit the website, our website to find out more. But last week, I'm excited because last week we uh, started this uh, segment called The Fall and started talking about sin. So exciting. <laughs> but uh, we're going to actually be continuing that, um, talking about sin as rebellion, selfishness, and idolatry. And so just to kick things off, let's t start talking about sin as rebellion. The Bible often portrays sin in terms of defiance and rebellion towards God as king and even father. Isaiah 1-2 uh, even says, I've raised children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. So this is seen in this light. Sin is personal and willful disobedience. When we actually know what we uh, shouldn't be doing, but we do it anyway. We rebel against God's word. Um, I think about, uh, to be honest, uh, I'm a Disney fan. And if you've ever seen Finding Nemo, you might know exactly the scene I'm about to bring up. But there's whole, that whole comical scene about the boat that is up there. And um, Sandy Plankton said, uh, uh, called it a butt, but it's <laughs> actually a boat. And Nemo, out of defiance with his father, um, goes and swims up there. And he's like, don't you dare touch the boat. And then he just goes ahead and touches it. And so that's the idea that we're trying to get around is rebellion. <laughs> you know the actual command or what you're not supposed to do and you do it anyway. Yeah, I mean, we were all children. Yes. So we've all done something just like that. And for those of us who are parents, now we're experiencing our children. You know, my father-in-law has this funny thing he says to my wife all the time when one of our kids acts up. He goes, you know, I, I prayed that you'd have a kid just like you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's a lighthearted way to really bring up something, you know, quite serious, right? Yeah. Like our personal, willful defiance against God. When we know it's wrong, when we know that he's watching and looking and knows and we do it anyway, yeah. um, is certainly an aspect of sin that we need to accept as correct, as biblical, as, as a true definition. That's really what we're doing is we're defining yeah. all of the different aspects and descriptions of sin. And the next one we want to look at is sin as selfishness. Um, when we sin, we're acting in a selfish attitude, a selfish mindset that assumes that our actions will lead to our own happiness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this has always been true of humanity that we want to be happy and we want to, you know, gratify our desires and all of that. But I think we are in a particularly strong season of this in our world today where definitely in America, self is king. And we've been talking about that on Sundays, right? Yeah. Self is the new God. Self is the new religion. And so um, this is a really, uh, really, I think, um, timely definition or description of sin that it is us in selfishness. When Adam and Eve sinned, which is rebellion, we just talked about that, um, the default human condition changed. And think about this. Previous to Genesis 3, the default human condition was, I have everything I need to flourish. In my relationship with God, I have everything I need. God, you've provided everything I need. And when you read the description of the Garden of Eden, it certainly sounds like a miraculously wonderful, beautiful place, often called paradise by theologians and, and those who study scripture. Um, and, you know, the default human condition changed, our posture changed from I have everything I need to actually God's holding out on me. And in order to get what I really want, I've got to rebel against him and do my own thing because I sit on the throne now, me, self, my, myself, me, myself, and I. Um, it's funny how you can track this through scripture, you know, even thinking of uh, one of the verses that really stands out to us anyway is Judges 21, 25, which is kind of fast forwarded into the history of Israel as a nation. It says, in those days, 
Israel had no king. They had no authority that they submitted to. There was no clear like, hey, everyone, let's go this way and let's live this way. Right. And it says that all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. That kind of, I think, captures well the day that we're living in. Yeah. We have a president. We have a government. But really, we're not submitted to anyone's authority except what we think is right. Yeah. And, and so we're just doing what's right in our own eyes. Um, this selfish disorder desire to follow self is compounded by this gratification message we're having uh, seen in our world. And it's interesting to think about generationally the different ways of thinking about life because right living used to be defined by saying yes to only the right desires and the right desires defined by a higher moral authority than us. <laughs> defined by scripture, defined by God who is good and he's the only one who's good. Now, right living is based on saying yes to anything I want, anything I desire, anything that feels good. I like how one of my favorite authors, John Mark Comer, put it. He said, happiness has become about feeling good, not about being good, which I think is really, uh, I don't know about you, really stings to really just say, yeah, I can see that in my own life. Because sin is manifested by our tendency to be what some church fathers have called uh, being curved inward towards self. It's the opposite of love, and and this really takes kind of a step back to some some church fathers I just mentioned, Augustine called sin, love turned in on itself. Martin Luther, the reformer, called sin man curved in upon himself. And so when we look at sin as as selfishness uh, or a selfish posture, what we're really talking about is instead of as a human created to worship God, instead of lifting my eyes above myself, instead of raising my hands, instead of surrendering my life to God who is bigger, greater, and good, and righteous, um, I just turn in on myself, and, and I say, well, what do I want? What do I desire? What will make me happy? And I get all you know, inwardly curved or, or inwardly grown in on myself, as these church fathers have defined sin. Um, but scripture calls us to live in a countercultural way, um, Paul, the apostle, among so many other scriptures we could, could quote today, but in Philippians two, he said, instead of being motivated by selfish ambition and vanity, each of you should in humility be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. That's the command of scripture, which flies in the face of what we're being told in our world today. Mm -hmm. And then the final aspect of sin we want to look at today is sin as idolatry. Scripture Um, often teaches us that idolatry is bowing down to a statue of wood or of gold or something else, especially in the Old Testament, worshiping a created thing instead of the creator. But in our modern world, we can certainly see that idolatry can also be found as something more subtle, um, seeking of approval, security, power, pleasure, etc. We can diagnose the idolatry of our hearts by examining the areas where um, maybe a simple desire has turned into a idolatrous mm-hmm. demand. What a way, what a term to think about that, um, that the 99 Essential Doctrines gives us. Anywhere we can see in our hearts that we have an idolatrous demand for something. So let's break this down a little bit and ask a couple of questions before we jump into discussion. Um, what is the greatest source of your fear or anxiety? That could lead you to an idol in your heart. Um, I think about, you know, we talked a little bit about kids acting in rebellion. Well, let's think about it in the reverse now as parents. You know, we all love our kids. Our kids are important to us. That's all good. But when when it goes too far into a fear or anxiety, it could be revealing that our kids have become idols to us. You know, when we're obsessed over, um, do our kids have what they need or want? Are our kids happy? Do our kids like us? You might be letting your love for your kids as a parent go too far into an idolatrous demand. Or just for you personally, individually, what do you depend on most in order to be content, peaceful, or joyful? Um, This could really expose addiction or self-gratification or comfort as an idol in your life. Um, What do you think about when you hear the words, I can't live without blank. Anything that comes to mind could uh, lead you to an idolatrous part in your, in your heart. That's why fasting, and we're in a season of fasting right now as a church, fasting is an excellent tool to expose idolatry in your life. Because the moment you start to say, I can do without this, that's when your flesh and your heart and, and the idolatrous demands flare up and go, no, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we're definitely in that season right now of kind of exposing some of that in our own lives. So I, I love the way the writer of 1 John puts it. Dear children, uh, 1 John five twenty one. dear children, 
Keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Mm. Some translations say keep yourself from idols, but I love how the New, New Living Translation really puts it in the reference of the stolen throne we've been in. Don't let anything take God's place in your life. So um, why is this important? It's important because the real purpose for your life is to become more and more like Jesus because Jesus is not only the likeness of God, he's the likeness of how man is supposed to be. Scripture calls him the second Adam. And so in all the ways that Adam was supposed to stay in that place of complete dependence on God, um, even though he rebelled and, and brought sin into the world, Jesus was sinless and he became like a second Adam in the same way scripture says that sin entered the world through one man's sin eternal life became available to us through one man's righteous act and, and through his sinless life, Jesus became not only God-likeness, but man-likeness. The, the ultimate example of human flourishing is found in Jesus, and you and I are meant to follow in his example. Um, he's the new Adam. He restores our relationship with the Father, and he brings us back to the relationship we were meant to have in God um, in the Garden of Eden. In 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, it talks about how Jesus loved us because he became poor so that we could become rich. Let me read this to you. You know that uh, the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was shown to us through, though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor so that in his poverty you could become rich. He switched places with us so that he could restore us in that relationship and bring us back into human flourishing, deliver us from the sin sickness that we find ourselves in. And when we follow and are enslaved to sin. So um, let's take a look at that a little bit deeper in our discussion. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're going to bring up some questions about sin as rebellion, selfishness, and also idolatry. And I want to just encourage you to just open up, be transparent, you know, share honestly from your life, because that's the way scripture says to confess our sins to one another. And the Lord's going to meet you in that place. So I'm excited for this, the discussion you're going to have. I'm excited to gather again this Sunday and keep going in Stolen Throne. And we'll see you next time at Watch Parties as well. Have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you soon.